Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to say a warm welcome, but uh, it is a bit chilly in here, but at least uh, we'll all stay awake. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Graham Herbert, Rector of Lockerbie Academy. You're in a £26 million complex, and uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh to, uh, to Lockerbie this evening. And uh, I hope that, you, uh, hope that you enjoy the evening. Our chairperson for the evening is uh, Jan MacDonald, and she's going to go take you through the housekeeping and all the rest of it, and I say I hope you have a, a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Well, good evening again. Um, it, my name is, as Mr. Herbert has just said, Jan MacDonald, and I'm the um, uh, chair of the project committee for the Dumfries and Galloway project, uh, of which this lecture is... <laughs> Um, uh, I have to do the housekeeping bits, as I've been told to, uh, and that is, first of all, that in event of fire, you should um, use that door, that door, that door, or that door, and go straight through that way, if you're going that way, which will take you out. I would also like to say that, of course, I'd to remind you to put your mobile phones off. Uh, this is really important. Um, when I was teaching, I actually had um, terrible punishments for people who didn't put their mobile phones off. The worst being that I would sing them a Gaelic song. As I can neither sing uh, nor speak Gaelic, this was a painful experience. So, off with phones. So, on behalf of the Royal Society of Edinburgh now, um, of course I would like to thank Mr. Herbert and everyone at Lockerbie Academy for their hospitality in hosting this event. Um, we are very pleased to be in such a lovely place um, and uh, it's been working beautifully this afternoon for the schools. Now, just before handing over to Professor Bolton, I'd like to say a quick word about the Royal Society of Edinburgh, about which some of you may not know a great deal. The Royal Society of Edinburgh was founded in 1783 and was really a fruit of the Scottish Enlightenment. It is described, accurately I hope, as Scotland's National Academy of Science and Letters. It's an educational charity, independent of government. The Society has about 1,500 fellows uh, elected by peer review and drawn from a very, very wide range of disciplines, from medicine, law, physics and chemistry, biological sciences, literature, history, philosophy, theology, and the creative and performing arts, as well as business and industry. So we do cover a very, very wide range of subjects. Um, famous um, fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in the past include Lord Kelvin and Sir Walter Scott, and in the present, Sir David Attenborough and J.K. Rowling. Um, so we've got a wide range of fellowships as well. Um, what we actually seek to do is um, to make meaningful and contribution to scholarship and public life in Scotland and beyond. Um, we do take our sort of strap line providing public benefit very seriously indeed. And we do this in many different ways, particularly encouraging innovative research, promoting enterprise, and conducting uh, major independent inquiries on matter of national importance. We also respond to requests from both the Scottish and the Westminster governments uh, for feedback on issues of national importance. Very important, however, and this is the bit that I'm coming to, is that we have an extensive outreach program for young people and communities throughout Scotland. And this is the RSC AT project. We started this in our growth a couple of years ago as a sort of pilot scheme, and because that worked so well, we looked around for another place to be at, if you see what I mean, and because what we really want to do is have the value of working with a community over a period of time and offering that community the opportunity to engage with us in a number of sustainable activities. So... Here we are in Dumfries and Galloway, and why did we choose here? Well, we chose here really um, for two reasons. Uh, one, obviously, that it's an area very, very rich in resources of all kinds, historical, economic, geographical, human. And we felt that to those, building on those, we could add value. And secondly, obviously, we have to go to a place where we are wanted. And it appeared to us from some kind of initial investigation that the people of Dumfries and Galloway seemed quite interested in what we were going to do. We had a meeting at Cat Strand in March, and there was a plethora of ideas, not all of which, I'm sorry to say, we could follow, but certainly there were very, very many of these. And in fact, we have tried 
to fulfill as many as we could. And interestingly enough, this evening's lecture is one of the things that was actually emerged from the Cat Strand meeting. It was also very, very important to us that actually it wasn't top down from Edinburgh, if you see what I mean. What we didn't want is that we descended on some poor place and said, we're from Edinburgh, we know what you want and this is it. So it was very important that we actually responded to what people wanted. So the RSC at B&G uh, program will offer a range of activities, including specialist lectures, popular talks and discussions, classes and workshops for schools. This afternoon, Professor Bolton did speak to the pupils of Lockerbie Academy, as well as exhibitions and presentations. Now, there already have been a series of events, because one of the ideas was to focus on the towns in Dumfries and Galloway and present a lecture that related to that particular place. So we had Richard Holloway and Religion in Newton Stewart, Professor Andy Walker and James Clark Maxwell in New Galloway, next to Parton, Maureen Park on pioneering treatment in mental illness at the Crichton Royal Hospital, eh, appropriately on the Crichton campus, Victoria Crow on her exhibition Plant Memory at Stranra, close to um, the Logan Galleries, um, sorry, Botanic Gardens, of course. And in October, Professor Roland Paxton and Brian Veach shared a double bill on the legacy of Thomas Telford at Langham. Now, you might think that, in fact, it's rather silly my telling you about that because they're all over, but, in fact, they're not because they are recorded, and if you look on the RSE website, um, you can um, get... The, um, the here, and, and you can read them, and you can hear them. And in the case of Victoria Crowe, for example, since she is an artist, uh, you can actually see her slides. So they are not gone and gone forever. If you would actually like to look at these or um, hear them, there they are. Finally, you might think, but most importantly this evening, it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome Professor Geoffrey Bolton. Um, professor Geoffrey Bolton um, was, until his recent retirement, Regis Professor and Vice Principal at the University of Edinburgh. He is also the General Secretary of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, in other words, one of the two most important people in the place. So I have to try to be very good because really, in a sense, he's my kind of boss, sort of. Um, Professor Bolton is also a member of the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, UK's top-level science and technology advisory body, and chairs the Royal Society of London, that is, Energy Work Group. Among many other important appointments, he was a member of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, of the Scottish Higher Education Funding Council, the Councils of the Natural, sorry, Natural Environment Research Council and the Royal Society of London. Um, he's quite busy, really. Um, his research, present research, is in the field of climatic and environmental change and energy. He is particularly interested in ice sheets. He has received many international and national prizes for his research, including the Lyle Medal of the Geological Society, the Kirk Bryan Medal of the Geological Society of America, the Seligman Crystal of the International Glaciological Society, and the Science Medal of the Institute of Contemporary Scotland. He has received honorary degrees from Chalmers University, Sweden, the University of Heidelberg, Birmingham University, and Kiel University. Today, he, this evening, he will talk to you on wind, water, and waves. He will explore the importance of wind, water and waves to Scotland and examine how, or perhaps if, recent developments in renewable energy technology help us to achieve carbon reduction targets. The waterways and climatic conditions existing in Dumfries and Galloway are important resources in the drive to increase renewable energy productions and lower Scotland's carbon footprint. So just as we've done in our other lectures in trying to fit the speaker with the topic and the place, um, that's what we're trying to do this evening. So I'm very happy to hand you over to Professor Bolton. Thank you very much. I feel thoroughly intimidated by lis listening to Jem. Listening to um, I can't believe that's me, but there we are. I, as I said this afternoon, I'm a very, m one of my greatest, greatest skills is that I'm a very adept pool player. Um, <clears throat> it was rather nerve wracking this afternoon, standing in front of um, about 60, 60 extremely well behaved children who look at you with that sort of gimlet eye 
uh, and occasionally one or two of them will smile, and I'm glad to say most of you look reasonably relaxed, and you're helping me to relax. What, what I thought I would do is, in contrast to some of the other talks that have been given in this series, which have been very much focused in on the region, to take this region as part of a larger world, uh, and ask some questions that are important for that larger world and equally important for this region. Uh, this is our region. We, we're, we're about here, underneath that heavy cloud, uh, which must be an unusual phenomenon if you live in, li live, live in Lockerbie. Um, and I'm going to try to relate what I have to say, which is very global in terms, to, to what might be the consequences for this region. And I want to talk about, primarily, the, the sources of energy which drive the earth that we live on and the way in which we as humans progressively over the years have tried to harvest part of that energy and what that project of harvesting the earth's energy might look like into the future. Uh, the energy which drives the earth and which we depend on for, for our every action comes from two sources and both of those sources are nuclear sources. All our energy ultimately is of nuclear origin. Um, one of the nuclear reactors that drives us is rather a long way away, it's the sun, a few million miles away, a good safe place to put a nuclear fusion reactor. And here you see the, the sun with great flares coming from its surface. This flare is going several thousand kilometers into the, into the solar atmosphere. This flare with a disk on top of, laid on top um, in a telescope uh, of the sun's disk shows uh, a magnetic flare that's going several million. Uh, miles into the sun's atmosphere and here we are, the earth in receipt not only of, of uh, radiation in the visible part of the spectrum in, uh, as light uh, but also a great deal of other radiation that come, comes from the sun. That's a key driver of the, of the earth system and not the only but the principal source of energy which keeps us alive. The other source of course is an internal source. We have a source of heat energy uh, in the middle of the earth which is a nuclear fission reactor. This reactor is a bit closer, it's a few thousand miles away, rather than a few million, mi million miles away. We see evidence of it almost everywhere, simply because as you go down it gets warmer, uh, and occasionally we see that more dramatically, uh, as in this explosion, volcanic explosion in Iceland a few years ago. Um, we also see, and if you stand on top of America and look to the west, on a good clear day, Elsa Craig here, which is an old volcanic plug, and here are some of the rocks, the older rocks of Scotland on the west coast, uh, which show evidence of being deeply buried within a hot earth and having been dramatically recrystallized. Some of the most basic things that we have learnt about energy come from these characters. Uh, Isaac Newton in the 17th century, who um, argued very clearly that energy would be conserved. You can't lose energy. You can transform it into another form of energy, but it's always there. Some of the energy might be highly energetic um, and, and highly localized, and that can dissipate into um, very dispersed, uh, uh, very weak forms of energy, but which is very, which is very extensive. Uh, Einstein added dramatically to that when he demonstrated that energy and mass were almost equivalent. That um, if you are able to pull atoms apart, then you release uh, enormous quantities of energy, which both under, under, underpins what we understand about uh, peaceful use, uses of nuclear energy, but also, of course, other uses of nuclear energy which we're not so fond of. I, I like this photograph of Einstein playing a violin. It's good to know there were some things where he was really, really bad. He was a useless <laughs> violin player. So just a few things about energy. I, sh I shall say things that many of you will know a great deal about, and hopefully for everyone I'll be able to say a few things that you don't know about. But I thought I'd simply introduce the, the, the idea. Energy, if you remember back at school, the capacity to do work, measured typically in kilowatt hours. Power is the work done in a particular period of time. Uh, so it's measured, let's say, in kilowatt hours per day. One of the things I've done in some of the slides that follow, for a very particular reason, is to give you energy production um, as the number of kilowatt hours per day per person. And in fact, you can create, a, you can make an estimate of the UK um, energy use 
Uh, the average uh, power consumption in the UK is 195 kilowatt hours per day per person. I suspect most of you living in rural areas, strange as it may seem, actually uh, use rather more than that. Newton's work led on very clearly to identifying a series of forms of energy, kinetic, the, the energy of, of, of impact, potential, if I lift something to a high level I've used energy in lifting it up, and when it falls it dissipates that energy. Uh, thermal energy, which we understand electromagnetic energy, um, the energy of electricity, chemical energy, which is the thing which all you have. You had, uh, I guess you had a meal earlier today, uh, which released uh, heat energy inside you and chemical energy, and you're now, you're now, you, you, you're now living off that. Um, and uh, when finally, sadly, as ultimately we all must, you lie in the ground, then the energy that's, uh, that your chemistry consists of will dissipate itself and no doubt warm thousands upon thousands of small animals who you'd be glad to bequeath yourselves to. And finally, of course, nuclear energy, which arises from this surprising realization that mass and energy are essentially equivalent. One form of energy can, 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 is readily uh, exchanged into another form of energy, and the, the simplest, the simplest uh, illustration is, is uh, uh, this uh, pendulum. Um, if we push the bob on the end of the pendulum to this position, uh, this height above a surface, um, then it has potential energy, which it then releases and transforms into kinetic energy as it, as it moves through here to this next point, where the kinetic energy is entirely dissipated, and you have yet more, and you have more potential energy. If there were no friction at the point where you're holding this, and if there were no air resistance, then the pendulum would swing forever. The reason it doesn't is because there's friction, because all of these systems where energy is transmuted from one form to another, in one way, lose energy by by dissipating it in, in, in an, another, f another form of energy, in this case heating, heat energy. And you're all of course familiar with this where we, uh, uh, we use up electrical energy um, to, in, a, in a light bulb which produces both light, uh, electromagnetic radiation and, and heat. So the energy from the sun that I spoke about earlier how does, how does the Earth receive it, and how does, it, how, how, how does that, how does that energy uh, impact upon the Earth and the way in which it behaves? Um, if you were to receive more heat energy than you give out, you'll become warmer. And you'll carry on getting warmer and warmer and warmer if that situation continues. Uh, if you give out more heat energy than you, you receive, then you will get colder and colder. Um, the heat that the Earth receives from the Sun uh, must be lost to space at exactly the same rate. The amount the Earth receives and the amount it loses must be the same. If it weren't, then the Earth would either get colder or it would get warmer. One thing we think we know, because there are quite large uncertainties based on recent satellite evidence, is that over the last 25 years the Earth has been getting warmer. Uh, on average, and based on, uh, uh, on examination of the, of the whole of the Earth's troposphere. Of course, clouds and gases in the, in the atmosphere absorb radiation and they give it out as heat, as heat energy. Um, 200 years ago, when we first be able to sense the temperature of a distant object, the question was asked, why is the moon 30 degrees colder than the Earth when both are the same distance from the sun? And the answer that was given quite correctly at the time is because we have an atmosphere. A uh, hundred years later, when the principles of greenhouse gases were, were, were determined by a Swedish scientist, then the relationships between the nature of a gas and its capacity to absorb radiation and to give out heat was, was established. So the average temperature of the surface will depend to a very large degree on how much gas there is here. All the planets in the solar system, the surface temperatures, depend on two things, the distance from the sun and how much gas is there in that, their atmosphere. Now this was supposed to be an animation, uh, but somehow it won't work on this machine. Uh, and what it simply shows is it, it, the way in which energy is, fluctuates across the Earth's surface in a very complex way. Uh, if if my, this animation were to work, you'd see these marvelous wispy patterns, and these patterns here, changing very dramatically as day follows day. Uh, this one shows 
the reflected radiation largely from the surface of clouds going back into the atmosphere and this one shows the heat that's emitted long wave radiation emitted from the Earth's surface because the Earth's being the Earth's surface is warm through the atmosphere but it gives out long wave radiation back into space and what you see are extremely complex patterns of change and it's simply that the Earth the Earth's atmosphere the Earth's oceans are turbulent places and the transformations of energy from heat into light into sound to many other things are, are, are complex in the extreme which is one of the reasons why it's very difficult to answer a question is climate changing and if so in what direction simply because in the short term it fluctuates dramatically and wildly we now know a tremendous amount about the way in which the heat regime of the energy regime of the earth has changed in the past and, and of course it leads us to the conclusion there's absolutely no reason why for perfectly natural reasons the earth's, earth's climate shouldn't continue to change uh, some of the best evidence we have comes from the big ice sheets this is this uh, photo from Antarctica uh, this is a, a radio echo image showing a mountain chain beneath this beneath this ice sheet uh, and the uh, the the depth of the peak mountain peaks is about a kilometer and the depth of that valley is about three kilometers so there's uh, at least three kilometers of ice in this location that ice of course in essentially consists of layers of frozen atmosphere and that's a seismic image through I think this location and you can see the layering in the ice which is accumulated year on year on year on year for the best part of uh, a billion years in this this place and if we can read the climatic message in the ice we have a remarkable climatic record this is a core uh, taken from the Antarctic ice sheet uh, the, the, this uh, core has gone down to about two and a half kilometers where as I say it's at which point it's about uh, a million years old uh, that's a piece of ice from the core being held in a gloved hand uh, and by looking at both the chemistry of the ice and the gases that are contained in the small bubbles in the ice we, we can deduce, deduce a great deal about the Earth's past uh, and this is a, a, a diagram which attempts to show the a proxy for global climate we, the climate in the middle of the Antarctic ice sheet over the last 250,000 years so that's 250,000 years ago that's the present day if you look carefully you can see this purple line and that purple line is telling us about climate and what it says is that at the, at the present day something we already know is relatively warm 20,000 years ago it was extremely cold and if we go back 120,000 years ago we come to another period which was approximately as warm in fact slightly warmer than the present day with a, a long and complicated cold period a so-called ice age in between we then go back another 100,000 years it's actually just off scale but about here there's the next warm period with this being the ice age in between <coughs> uh, an Edinburgh shoemaker called James Crowell about 150 years ago applied to the University of Edinburgh to do mathematics the University of Edinburgh in, in, in a typical way uh, always turns down the best brains uh, turned down Crowell Crowell had a theory of climate change which was quite right except he didn't know the calculus if he'd gone to Edinburgh University and, and learnt some calculus he would have got his theory right a hundred years before it actually was shown to be correct and basically what's happened is that um, it happens a Serbian mathematician called Milankovic uh, calculated from Newtonian mathematics uh, Newtonian physics uh, the way in which the uh, radiation coming to the earth would have changed through time as a consequence of change of the earth's orbit around the sun and uh, this is the uh, pattern he showed and without going into in, in, in detail you can see that the present warm period coincides with a warm period in the radiation coming from the sun that warm period coincides with a uh, uh, high level of radiation from the sun and, and so on there's a very strong correlation what's interesting however is that when uh, a Belgian mathematician about 30 years ago tried to calculate what the temperature effect on the earth would be of these fluctuations he concluded that the temperature difference between the coldest periods and warming period, warmest periods would be about half a degree Celsius in fact geological reconstructions have shown that the temperature difference between this cold period 20,000 years ago and the present day is actually about 6 degrees Celsius in other words it's 10 times bigger than the theory suggests 
And yet, this gets the tempo of change right, it gets the amplitude wrong. It's as if somehow the Earth is a radio receiver receiving information from the Sun, um, that it's, because this essentially is a solar signal, receiving information from the Sun, the radio responds, the climate responds with the right sort of frequency, but somewhere there's a knob that turns up the volume. And the question is, where's that? And the answer, we think, is it here? This is the, going back to Antarctica, uh, this in uh, blue is the temperature record, this time over 450,000 years. Those are the warm periods. These are the cold periods in between. And in red, you see the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And we believe that the process that uh, joins these two, two things together is that if we get a slight warming of the Earth, uh, as a consequence of, uh, of uh, solar, in, solar changes, changes in the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, then if you remember hundreds of years ago, which is when I was, was taught this for the first time, that um, carbon dioxide is, is more soluble in cold water than in warm, so if the, uh, if the Earth warms a little, the oceans give up carbon dioxide, which of course intensify the warming. And in fact, the calculations that have been made would suggest that the carbon dioxide, when it's kicked off by these solar changes, can indeed amplify the, the uh, thermal signal at the level that's required. In other words, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, it looks as if they are uh, the key, the, the volume knob that, uh, that makes the Earth's climate respond in the way I've suggested. So, climate changes, uh, and uh, we know that it was extremely cold 20,000 years ago, and it's got warmer since then, believe it or not. Uh, you have evidence locally of all this. This is a satellite image showing Solway here, that we're somewhere up there, I apologize, I, uh, I, I didn't quite get it far, far enough north. And these remarkable striated streamlined features in the, Colway, in the Solway Plain, some of considerable, considerable length, can be found in the valleys that drain down to Solway, where, where we now are. Uh, we have, in this last winter, found remarkable evidence of how those things fall. This is a research group that I, I run. We've been working in Antarctica down here. This is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. That's the Greenland Peninsula. That's a glacier in the, in the ice sheet we've been looking at, called the Rutford Ice Stream. And this is the first ever uh, radar picture beneath two kilometers of ice to show the form of the bed. And you can see the bed of the ice sheet is pretty much the same as it is in the, Colway, in, in the Solway Plain. You see these remarkable lineated uh, landforms on the bed of the ice sheet two kilometers beneath the surface. Now this is a bit of fun. Um, this is a computer simulation uh, which runs from about 26,000 years ago to the present day in its attempt to match the geological evidence of, of the change in the ice sheet that covered uh, much of Europe uh, at its maximum extent 20,000 years ago. We're, we're 26,000 years ago here. There's a big ice mass on, on Norway. This is the North Sea in there. Britain's there. And we're somewhere here. And uh, if I do the right things, I can make that ice sheet advance and decay. So here we go. It's, we've, now, whoops, we've now got an ice, an ice dome developing over Scotland. Uh, the European ice mass and the Scottish ice mass flow towards each other. They then coalesce in the middle of the North Sea. We have a great ice ridge shown by that blue line over southwest Scotland. The arrows show the direction of flow. Here, there was the maximum of glaciation and now it's getting warmer and the ice sheet's beginning to retreat and eventually she disappears and, and there we are, the ice sheet's gone away and the question is, well, what did it leave behind? And the answer was um, a, a landscape that had no trees, no plants, no animals that was raw, bare mineral material the sort of landscape you might see in, in northern Greenland or parts of Iceland where the glaciers have recently retreated. But then we have an enormously rich record of what's happened since then. This is a, a, a peat cutting on one of the flanks of Merrick. And uh, in that peat cutting, if you take samples of the peat, put them under the microscope, you see things like that. Uh, these, in, in reality, are very small. They're a fraction of a millimeter in diameter. Uh, that's an oak, uh, uh, that's an oak uh, pollen grain. That's a pollen grain from birch. That's a pollen grain from pine. And that's a grass. Uh, you also see these things, 
which match these rather beautifully. That's a beetle, of course. And these are beetle alight elytra, the wing cases of beetles. And they're giving us environmental information about this uh, beet sequence. And because we can date the individual layers of the peat using radiocarbon, we can begin to build up uh, an environmental picture of the evolution uh, of the, both the climate and the vegetation um, uh, since the ice sheet went away. And this is the sort of result one gets. Uh, it's a pollen diagram. It starts at 14,000 years ago, which is when the peat began to accumulate. It ends pretty much at the present day. Uh, because we have the pollen grains and we can count the, the frequency of pollen grains, we can deduce these, tree, these different species. Uh, that's dwarf birch, which is an arctic alpine birch, that's ordinary birch, that's scots pine, and there's oak. And if one looks at these diagrams, you see here, uh, if we we'll look at uh, birch here, that birch was uh, important, an important part of the tree flora before 12,000 years ago, then diminished, and then it grew, uh, expanded, uh, in this last 6,000 years. If we look at things like um, oak, uh, alder and hazel, which are typical broadleaf forests of rich, warm periods, then we find that they expand uh, in their importance until about 6,000 years ago and then decline dramatically. In fact, this period is a period dominated by herbs and grasses, so is that. This is a forest period. The reason why we go from herbs and grasses to forest is because the climate's ameliorating, it's getting warmer, the soils are developing. The reason why we go from um, forest back to a landscape which is dominantly grassland, and that's uh, the creamery in Lockerbie, and there you see some bare hillsides, is us. Uh, we arrived in, well, we didn't arrive, but we began to develop farming practices about 6,000 6, years ago, uh, which dramatically cut into the tree landscape and indeed, we know that by the first forest survey in Scotland, by about 17, 1720, I think, we were down to something like 12% of the interglacial forest cover. Largely as a consequence of the Forestry Commission, we're now back at 24% of the interglacial forest cover. So we see a dramatic change in the land landscape, the nature of the landscape, over that period of time, partially driven by climate and partially driven by us. Uh, and indeed, you can now find no part of the world on land or in the oceans where you can't detect human activity. Innocence has gone. Uh, the rivers changed as well dramatically. We know that because we can see evidence from it in the landscape. This of course is from the modern day Arctic, but it's a sort of, uh, can you imagine the Nith Valley as it was 13,000 years ago? And uh, you see the flanks of it, almost no vegetation, sediment readily released, um, braided streams which are forever changing their courses, and the present day river, a single canalized river uh, dominated by uh, heavy, quite heavy vegetation on both flanks, a quite different regime, a very, very different environment. And of course one of the unintended consequences of that deforestation um, is that um, flooding is more frequent and more devastating. And indeed, if uh, climate gets wetter, as many claim it is or, or will do, uh, then the frequency of flooding will inevitably increase. And the reason one gets greater flooding from this relatively bare landscape, that's the headwaters of the river that's lower down and that's, well, very close to home, um, it is simply because the speed with which water can run off from a surface is determined by how much vegetation there is. With a lot of trees, they physically obstruct water getting into the, into the river, and uh, if you have, a, say, a 12-hour uh, rainstorm, it may take three days in a heavily forested catchment for the water to get into the river. If there's no forestry, it can take half a day. Uh, in other words, you get a much bigger flood. In addition, of course, trees absorb water from the soil, and they transpire that water into the atmosphere such that the total amount of rainfall, uh, a large proportion of it, possibly 50% of it, will go straight back into the atmosphere as trees transpire. So flooding is one of the consequences of the deforestation that we, we've known in the recent past. So, uh, how do we take the energy that we need and without which we as individual animals uh, and we as a society and civilization would not be able to survive. Uh, how, where does it come from? Uh, how has it changed through time? I mean, the first assertion is that uh, 
that human material and cultural progress has been determined by the extent to which we're able to derive energy from the earth. In other words, capture some of the energy that's there all the time. And uh, this, is, uh, this is us a million years ago, good looking chap, and here you see us stepping, stepping up. Um, the accessibility of energy uh, was helped enormously by developments, first of all in tool making, then in agriculture, uh, uh, much more efficient agricultural systems in, 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 in the medieval period. This is the Industrial Revolution, and this is where we now are. If you look at some of these, these building blocks and these columns, you'll see this is the uh, energy contained in the form of food, and this is the, this is the amount of energy we receive individually. Uh, this is, uh, so, uh, as you can tell, uh, given the, the girth of the average uh, Scots, Scotsman these days, uh, then it's not surprising to know that we've actually increased the amount of energy that we, we consume in the way of food. This is a domestic energy for cooking, heating, uh, and, and the like, and you see that's increased dramatically. This is the energy for industry and agriculture. That's the energy for uh, transport, which is the element of energy which is growing dramatically. The important thing to note, of course, is this, this, this is individual production, or individual use of energy. If you then uh, plot onto this the way in which the world's population has changed, you'll see that the actual, the total energy use, um, would follow a curve something like that. It would be up, up there simply because population has increased dramatically over that time period. And it's useful to look back and think what this energy is now equivalent to. Um, a, a single tank commander has at his disposal more power than was available to an Egyptian pharaoh in building the pyramids, or to a Ming emperor in helping to build the Great Wall. And this is an enormous device for ripping coal out in Germany, uh, the amount of energy of which either of these two gentlemen would have been really envious, envious of. So we are abstracting from nature now much, much more energy than we, the, than we did in the past. Although if you compare that with the, uh, with the total energy that's available in the Earth system, even now we, we, we extract a very, very small proportion. This is, if you like, the, the penultimate step in that energy staircase I, I showed you, and it's a place that, you, that some of you will know, the mill at Gatehouse of Fleet, the aqueduct that um, brings water into the system, and the transfer of potential energy uh, in this mill wheel uh, into mechanical en energy which, which su supported the mill. The explosion of the, uh, of the uh, Industrial Revolution, which uh, has been built on the back of, uh, initially at least, traditional technologies and then subsequently more and more science-based science technologies has taken us far beyond this point. If we look at the, the real driver of, of change, uh, there can be no doubt in my mind that it's this. This shows global uh, carbon emissions over the last, in fact it goes back to about 1800, um, global carbon emissions uh, through time. Those car global carbon emissions you can think of as a proxy for the amount of energy that's being used. And you can see this dramatic increase in, in energy use. That's global population, we're now sit standing about there, uh, at about 6.5 billion. Uh, in 1800 we were about 1 billion, so we've grown significantly. It's interesting to see that the point of inflection in this curve at about 1950 is also located here on the, on the, on the energy curve. And I've, there's no doubt in my mind at least, or let's say very little doubt, that that is the cause of that. The two are really intimately related, and all the things that go with energy use. One sees those patterns very clearly uh, using, uh, from satellite images. This is a, um, uh, a map that shows the progression of night uh, across the globe and picks up the irradiance of different parts of the globe. If you compare the, this with, uh, with uh, similar things produced about 15 years ago, the change is really quite dramatic. And you can see that the whole of North America is lit up, most of Eurasia is hit, lit up, so, it, so, is, so is India, China's lighting up dramatically, South, South America is lighting up. And it's a, it's a progressive phenomenon. It's a function of the urbanization which dominates, dominates human society. But, at the same time, um, we, most oil experts now are persuaded that we, are, we may even have passed peak oil. 
and that the resources that we've exploited in the past are from here on likely to decline, decline quite quickly. That decline, of course, will depend on two things, population growth on the one hand uh, and on the operation of the global economy on the other. It could be faster, it could be slower, but uh, it, 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 most analysts suppose that by 2050 then the, um, there will be a real scarcity of oil and the price hike associated with it. If we look at coal, then we see a very similar pattern. Um, a few years ago, the presumption was that we had hundreds of years of coal. Uh, work that's now been going on, particularly in the U.S., suggests that may not be true. Uh, and in fact, you see the same sort of decline here, that by the end of the century, a very, very significant deficit in the total amount of coal that's available compared with the present. And of course, the other thing that's happened is not simply that we uh, appear to have running out of resource, but one of the impacts of um, of that burning of fossil fuel, fossil carbon, it has been to increase the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So typically, warm periods like the present in geological time have been associated with a, uh, a carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere of about 270 parts per million. We're now up at about over 380 parts per million. It's been going, going up quite dramatically. If you look at this graph, which shows again the carbon dioxide concentration through the ice ages, that's where we are now. We're higher than anything we've known, certainly for the last million years, and probably for the last 30 million years. And if the assertions I made early on about the impact of increasing gas concentrations in the atmosphere, we suppose this must have had, and is likely to have, an, an effect. This is... Um, um, a, a accumulation of global temperature data uh, over the last 130 uh, years uh, and you see this, uh, this strong, strong rise. Uh, this early part, much of that is associated with natural phenomena, volcanic eruptions, uh, enhancements of solar radiation and indeed similar uh, small scale peaks here uh, uh, are of similar origin or certainly of similar origin. But um, clim cl climatological researchers find it almost find it impossible to explain that. Uh, what they would have supposed is that if you looked at natural processes only, temperature would, if anything, have been declining here. In fact, it's been rising. And the presumption is that's us. That's a consequence of the exhalation of, of, of greenhouse gases by human society. So the question is then, who has been greedy? Who's been, uh, who's been taking all this... Um, if you like, using the atmosphere as a sink uh, for the pollutants that we create. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we are here, that's us. Um, if you compare us with the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, they pollute the atmosphere some ten times less than we do. Uh, and I think Rwanda pollutes it, I think this may be a Rwanda in here, uh, rather less. Uh, the US and Canada pollute, pollute the atmosphere to twice the degree that we do, and uh, Qatar is just off the scale. Um, it's really quite, uh, really quite dramatic. So that's, that's, in a sense, an index of the way in which we have been able, through time, to utilize the carbon resources of the Earth at a time when we didn't realize that this would have some unintended consequences. At the same time, of course, it's, it's politically enormously contentious. It's the very basis of arguments between India, China, European Union, the US, about what, if anything, one might do about this. Yes. Is that adjusted for population? Yes, sorry, the horizontal axis is population. Right. So this is, the, uh, this is the consumption per person. Right. And that's the, pop that's the population along there. So that's China. So the total amount that China emits is actually given by the area of that. But uh, many of us would argue that, in fact, it's, it is more just to think in terms of individual consumption rather than, rather than national consumption. So uh, let's have a look at the fuels that we use for energy. Th this is the energy content in kilowatt hours per kilogram. And you see that coals, I mean, coking coal has got an energy content of about 8 uh, kilowatt hours per kilogram, petroleum 13, uh, Mars bar 5.5. 5. 
but that's a kilogram of Mars bar, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, really going some. Uh, interestingly, hydrogen, 39, and there are ways in which you can use hydrogen, and of course, the, the whole business of transferring mass into energy gives us this enormous, uh, I I I enormous multiplier. Uh, and it's also important to go back to the issue of conversion processes, transitions. This is what, what we do much of the time in burning these things is we take the chemical energy which is contained in the substance, we then burn it, we create heat energy. That heat energy is often used in a machine, let's say a, a steam boiler, uh, which creates mechanical energy, uh, and then we use that mechanical energy in electrical motor to create electrical energy. Now, of course, every one of these transitions loses some energy because it passes into other forms that we don't use. Uh, so, for instance, chemical energy, you can generate light, and you, generate, you, might, you might generate sound, uh, and, and, uh, and mechanical consequences as well as combustion. So, every step is a reduction of the total amount of energy originally available. So, let's suppose there was 100 units of energy there. By, by, by this process, you might find you've got 70 units left there. This mechanical translation is often very inefficient. You might have 30 units by the time it gets there. By the time you've done this, then the amount of energy there is probably about 10% of the, the amount you really originally started with. So the clever thing for scientists is to work out how we can, if we want to go there, how we can leap directly from chemical energy to electrical energy. And there are ways of doing that. So you want to minimize the number of transitions. So the answer is obvious, isn't it? We replace all this um, energy from carbon by renewable energy uh, through the use of biomass, solar, which would be particularly efficient here in Lockerbie. Uh, sorry. Geothermal, well, we'd have been, we'd, we'd done really well for geothermal energy 300 million years ago. In Edinburgh, we have at least six volcanoes, so we'd have been spoiled for choice, but that's a long time in the past. Wind and water are the two obvious um, re re renewable forms, although biomass is an interesting one in that if you burn a tree today and plant another one tomorrow, the net consequence of that in terms of carbon is zero. So, let's have a look at some of these energy forms and see what they can give us. This is um, a, a wave energy map from the parameter of the Atlantic. Uh, blue colors are low wave energy, high colors are green colors, and then yellow colors here are high wave energy. Uh, Lockerbie, as you can tell, is, is about there, so we're doing, we're doing pretty well for wave energy. This is a southeasterly gale in the southern part of the um, Sea of the Hebrides, uh, and you can see um, this is about 25 kilometers, and you can see these wave sets. These actually are rather large waves. The waves that if you're on a small boat you would, you, you, you would experience are, are actually smaller than uh, the, these features. And you can see these two marvelous sets of in intersecting uh, uh, wave systems driven by a southeasterly gale. That's uh, the beach at Tyree on a, on, a wind, on a breezy day. And that's the Palamis device, which is, which is built in, in Leith. Um, uh, sitting astride a series of waves and as, uh, uh, as they pass beneath it it buckles and the buckling uh, um, uh, uses uh, a series of, essentially a series of pistons to generate, uh, generate electrical energy uh, wind again we're lucky we've got lots of it I mean, the most, the, the, the most powerful wind belt in the world, of course, is the Circumantarctic belt, where sailors frequently go missing. Uh, but the Northeast Atlantic, again, is, is important in this regard, and here we are, there's, Lock there's Lockerbie. Uh, it's important to note, of course, that uh, if you pick up energy from kinetic forces, this is uh, kinetic energy from the wind coming into a, a, a propeller blade, then you lose that kinetic energy is diminished so that on the lee side of the on the lee, lee side of the uh, the device whatever it is then the, the velocity will be lower um, so you must have an impact on 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 uh, on, on, the, on the wind velocity uh, this is a series off the coast of east anglia of, of wind turbines this is a series just north of stirling which some of you will know uh, and of course this is one of the reasons why many people protest here you see the splendid skyline of Stirling and this marvellous, uh, marvellous background. Uh, my wife and I often decide we're going to divorce, and the only basis in which we're going to divorce is that I don't like these things and she thinks they're wonderful. Um, and there, there again you can see the en available wind energy, the purple patch here, it's a strong, strong uh, 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 
uh, when damage availability and again we're in a place where there's lots of it so what about tides well this is a tidal map of, of, uh, of the British continental shelf um, the areas that are red and yellow are high tidal high tidal strengths and again as many of you will know of course uh, here in St George's Channel and in the mouth of Solway they're very strong they're very strong tides this is Collie Brecon on the west just south of Scarborough on the west of Scotland you can see this tide streaming away it can go up to about 15 knots and it's quite impressive if you're sailing a boat at one knot and, and actually you're sailing against the tide which means you're doing, going backwards for, by 16 knots and that's one of the whirlpools in Collie Brecon and this is, um, this is a rotor blade uh, a, a waiting installation uh, in a small experimental system in, in, in the Pentel and Firth uh, well what about the reliability of these systems the answer is that tides are very reliable we can predict them with great precision literally years ahead if you find two locations for instance the western side of the uh, Mull of Kintyre you could put tidal devices 20 uh, miles apart and they would have antiphase relationships in other words when the tide is slack at one it will be running faster than another if you had two devices there you could maintain an almost constant constant energy output wind is a bit of a disaster not only that this is um, uh, 2009 and it's I think five days in winter where there wasn't enough wind to move the turbines and of course what that means is that when there's no uh, wind to move the turbines you've got to have a backup where do you get the backup from? coal, oil in other words not only do you have the cost of the turbines you've got to co the cost of the backup as well so it's not a particularly efficient system hydro of course of which we have lots in Scotland uh, most of it put up in the 1930s uh, uh, a nice dam here this shows how the system works you have a water from behind the dam uh, being led through uh, a tube uh, past um, a turbine analogous to this sort of thing where water flushes past the turbine blades which then uh, has an electrical motor on the end and transfers mechanical energy into electrical energy so that's, that's grand well uh, what do we use all this energy for this is our 195 kilo, kilowatt hours per day per person that's what uh, probably on the low side of what you and I use uh, and this is how we use it uh, so uh, that's our cars that's uh, air traffic this is heating, cooling at work and at home this is um, food, farming, fertilizers this is what I call stuff stuff me is your mobile phone your laptop, your telly, your fridge and all that we have an awful lot of stuff uh, a hundred years ago we had almost no stuff uh, but we've got a lot of it now so that's how we use the, the energy that's available to us individually now let's get real let's apply a little bit of physics to all this little lot because frankly there's an awful lot of hot air talked about renewable energy let's suppose that we wanted to harness all the wave power and all the tidal power we could uh, in, in, uh, around Britain so let's say we put a wave device all 700 kilo 750 kilometres off the west coast of Scotland impossible of course but let's suppose we could do it and the similar one of the western approaches we put a tidal power uh, uh, system uh, across northern Scotland across to Norway and a similar one again in the western approaches how much power could we get from what is obviously a ludicrously uh, overestimate, overestimated a version of what would be possible well the raw power uh, here would be 16 kilowatt hours per day per person that compares with 195 that we use um, but of course if you think of efficiency then it only gives you ultimately 4 kilowatt hours per day per person trivial in that 195 if you look at tidal streams then tidal, tidal, tidal barriers are somewhat better they would give us if you take the efficiencies, uh, inefficiencies out about 11 kilowatt hours per day per person so they are relatively small contributors in the global scheme of things if however you're a small community here and you've got your own little system and let's say it provides you with power you can do it, that's fine but if you ask on the larger scale of a national economy is this really effective, the answer is probably not I, I'm trying to annoy as many as I can by making extreme statements I hope some of you are getting slightly annoyed otherwise we would have a discussion 
If you then look at, let's say, the total amount per week of wind per week we get, and this is again making slightly ludicrous assumptions about the extent to which we could uh, locate wind farms across the length and breadth of Britain, and you can see it's half the amount of, of, of power that we use individually on average uh, by using our cars. So the numbers that we get from renewables are really quite small. This is a this is something I really like. This is a clever fellow versus Cambridge who said, well, let's, let's maximize the total amount of hydropower we get. So let's take every drop of water that, that, that falls on Britain, and we know the shape of Britain, and we'll let that water flow down Britain to the sea, and every single bit of potential energy from that power is, is, is utilized. How much could we get? And the answer is we get about 7 kilowatt hours per day per person. So someone who tells you that hydropower in other words, flooding our deepest, most beautiful glens and valleys is an answer to something. It may be an answer locally, but in terms of, again, the national economy, it's not an answer at all. And, of course, one of the problems is that most of the renewable sources of energy, are, or many of them at least, have a very big footprint. This shows the power per... Power per my, my point is dying, so I think I'll I just... No. And I'll consign it to oblivion. Uh, it simply shows the, the power per unit land area per, per, per square meter. You could say wind, we get two watts per square meter. Uh, from uh, um, hydroelectrics, we get 11 watts per square meter. Uh, from geothermal, we get a tiny amount. And then if you compare that with what I call a modern central generator, which is a big coal-fired power station, or a big nuclear station, or a big, a big, a, a big uh, uh, oil, oil star power station, there we get about 1,000 watts per meter squared. In other words, as it says here, if renewable facilities are going to be the major contribution to national energy, they have to be countryside, countrywide, countryside, simply because they are so, so diffused. So, <clears throat> could we make up an um, assemblage of ed energy sources that would permit us to, uh, uh, to, to respond to our demands? And the answer is, yes, we could. And I put out here three plans. Uh, the NIMBY plan, the Green plan, the Economist plan. The NIMBY plan is one where, you know, you don't want any of this stuff anywhere near you, thank you very much. As long as it's a long way away and the pylons don't obtrude on your view, then you're, you're fine. So... We would have something I'm going to talk about in a moment, a solar power in deserts, we'd have clean coal, and don't forget we don't know what clean coal is, it means coal power fire stations with uh, sequestration in geological reservoirs, we'd have nuclear, and then we'd have relatively small contributions from a wide variety of renewable, renewable sources. So that's the, you, it's the out of sight, out of mind view, not in my backyard. The green plan is the one where you want to maximize uh, all the uh, the um, uh, the um, uh, renewable sources, where inevitably wind, both offshore wind and onland wind, are, are important. One of the difficulties of, the, of course of that is it's extremely costly. I mean, the only reason that wind farms are produced at the moment in Britain is because there's a, a large subsidy. And again, notice at the top, solely in deserts. The right-hand side, the economist's plan, although many would argue that the economists have really got it right, but there we are, and that's one which would, which would go strongly on nuclear, and, many, uh, and, and wind, for example, would be a tiny, tiny contribution. The social reality, then, is actually crucial. Who chooses? You know, whose opinion are we going to have? And if there is, um, if it transpires that we need to make these changes because the fossil fuels are dying and because we believe that there is a strong probability of, un, uh, of unacceptable uh, demands on the surface. So, how kind. Thank you very much. There we are. Terrific. Got a red one this time. Um, then, the question then arises, given these varieties of opinion, do we have the the political drive to do anything but it isn't clear at the moment that anyone has really done anything anywhere <clears throat> now just one one uh, hopefully reasonably final comment uh, and that is that the transmission system moving electricity around for example 
moving whatever power source around is crucially important. Those of you that uh, are, are computer whiz kids will realize that 20 years ago we all thought the nature of the computer on your desktop was the most important thing. Now we realize that's not true. The computers, the boxes don't matter too much. The only thing that really matters is the network. In, in, it's connectivity that really matters. And of course, if you have big connectivity in energy uh, with lots of conne interconnections, then you can take your wind power from where the wind is blowing. Uh, so you don't have to have a backup station. All you need to do is take it. The wind's blowing strongly in the Alps. You take it from the Alps and you transport it back up to Scotland. There are some problems there, but they're not insuperable. And this shows on the right-hand side the, um, the Scottish... Uh, whoops... The Scottish network, so I'm not a very good shot with this, on the right hand side, the Scottish and UK network, and the fact that that is connected up to uh, a European network through a connect connection of the channel, uh, and there are plans at the moment uh, in the European Commission for a much expanded uh, network that could have considerable efficiencies. It suffers, of course, from the fact that national governments believe that all these things are in their court, and one of the problems, I think, in this domain, as in many others, is that, that countries are the wrong size. You know, I mean, they're, they're not very useful things, countries. I mean, they're very good for history and all that sort of thing. But actually, if you want to use them to do something practical, they're not very useful. And, of course, uh, if you speak of Europe in, 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 uh, in, in these terms, then I'm afraid a significant proportion of the British population thinks that's a very bad deal indeed. One thing that has been gaining a lot of credibility recently, but I'm skeptical that somehow we can create the political drive and, and coordination that would be required, is utilizing solar power, uh, what I call here importing other people's sunshine. Uh, if you look at those large squares, and the, the large yellow squares, and the, the, the proposal is not that they should, uh, one should occupy areas of land like that, but if you had concentrated solar systems such as the one shown on the right-hand side, each one of those large squares could provide, as it says here, a billion people with Europe's average consumption of 120 kilowatt hours per day per person, which is a little bit smaller than Britain's, of course. Um, and if you were to say, well, let's disperse that a little bit, then this is the sort of thing, each of those dots is about 1,500 square kilometers, which actually isn't all that big an area. If you fill them with, with, with solar devices, you could actually do the same thing. Um, and there's very serious interest in this, because, of course, those countries are countries where the gross national product is not high, and selling electricity to Europe is something that they would, they, 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 they would, they would welcome enormously. So... Where do we go with all this? One could create, one could plan, if planning is your, uh, your, 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 your preference, one could plan uh, for a system of energy generation uh, which would serve Britain's current needs. Um, uh, this is a, a, a diagram showing where things might be. There's a great deal of... Uh, um, of, uh, of, of, of green area that dedicated to uh, um, um, biofuels. Uh, there are some major stations, nuclear stations, largely in the southeast of England, near the major centre of population. There's an enhancement of hydropower and so on and so on. Uh, but you'll see that solar in desert element cropping, cropping up again. And indeed, if one wanted to maximize the efficiency of this system, you'd net network it through Europe so we could take electricity from wherever it was being most cheaply, cheaply generated. Uh, can we get here? I don't know. I think it's problematic. Um, what would it take us to move in this direction? It might take uh, climatic consequences, which were so severe we felt we couldn't, we couldn't hold them at bay. At the moment, there are, I think, a growing proportion of, of, of the population who are highly sceptical about the things that are said about future climate, and no doubt that scepticism will continue until a reason for not being sceptical arrives. Um, so it's a very, very difficult challenge. The question is, what's the magnitude of the challenge compared to what we know in the past? We think of the dramatic changes that took place in Britain and worldwide as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Arguably, this is a at least on that scale, except, of course, it's potentially in the other direction, because hydrocarbons have been marvelously intensive in highly efficient ways of gaining energy. 
And if I'm right in asserting that social and cultural development have been dependent on energy, then if energy is going to get more difficult to get, which means more expensive, then if you like, it's like the Industrial Revolution in the opposite direction. And that's going to require political coherence and consistency of a sort we haven't known. And I, I use this last image. You all know where it is. Uh, in a sense, what it's doing is looking back to the last heroic age of engineering, or the end of the last heroic age of engineering, which, in a sense, brought the Industrial Revolution to fruition. Um, of course, it's that same heroic age, arguably uh, fueled by the uh, presumptions of the Enlightenment, that got us into the mess we're now in, if you think we're in a mess at the moment. In other words, the massive dependence on, 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 on energy sources. Um, if what I've said proves to be ultimately to be correct, then my view is that we have another heroic age of engineering that we've got to undertake uh, to engineer into the environment in ways which are clever, sensitive and intelligent and, and, and coordinated because frankly I, I see no reason for supposing there is any way back to the simple life we've engineered the, in the past out of ignorance and from here on we somehow have to engineer uh, out of wisdom and we've got to engineer our politics we've got to engineer our society it's a, it's a big call I'm a geologist and I'm used to the idea of extinctions so I mean, you know the problems we now have for me are like the flick of a candle flame. But I suspect there are not many of you that can afford that sort of detachment. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Jeffrey. If you'd like to um, come over, I'm sure that you have roused people to ask a great many questions. And um, if you're she will be down there with her mantle. Um, yes, good. Um, and so if you'd like to put your hand up, she'll come and uh, you can speak to Anyone else over here? You, you mentioned earlier that there was no wind farms built unless it was for government subsidy. Uh, are, the environmental cost of putting in the wind farms and the concrete and everything, do they outweigh the advantages of the actual wind energy? Or what is your position? You said you also hated them. <laughs> well, well I, sorry. I mean, I, I only hate them on the basis that some of the nicest hills seem to have them on. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm an ancient mountaineer, so I care about these things. Um, we, the, these are early days to understand what the life of a wind farm is. Um, the evidence that's coming now from particularly Denmark and Germany suggests that the average life of the wind farm is likely to be over 20 years, maybe longer, as technology gets better and we learn how to do things a lot better. So in a sense you have to think in terms of what uh, of, the, of, of, of that 20 year period and at what point do you get to your return on investment? And when I say investment, I mean in the sense of a social investment, which is money that's being used to do that rather than something else plus the public money that goes into supporting these things through the renewable obligation, uh, which, uh, which is the source, of, the source of subsidy. And the calculations that have come out of Germany so far, if you take the whole cost of the uh, concrete and all that and all the secondary consequences in terms of the emissions that uh, are generated by creating a wind farm, suggests that um, you're not getting a return on investment uh, until you get into about year 12 to 15. So it's, it's quite a short period of, of return. Um, and of course the key question is, uh, it, is there a cheaper alternative, a, a cheaper alternative that's an acceptable alternative, or is there not? And the answer is there's not, then if we want to maintain the energy levels that sustain our lives, then we have to pay that we have to pay that premium. The question that arises is, well, could we afford to pay the premium and live the lives we do? And the answer could be no. So there's some big high-level economic questions to be thought of. And of course, I mean, that, my, my view is that if, if, if the patterns or the predictions of the resource economists are correct about the fall away of both availability of coal and petroleum, um, then 
energy prices are going to go up very strongly in, in, in the future. And the question is, is the global economy strong enough to sustain that? And, and, as I say, just a simple job. Again, so you, you've quoted some figures on uh, energy use, and you've shown how from sort of early years it's gone dramatically upwards. Um, you don't, well, I don't think you made any comment about whether we can reduce our energy consumption and whether our energy should be put into trying to look at ways of being more efficient with energy rather than just assuming we're going to go on consuming in that way. Well, if, if those people who uh, think about this sort of thing a lot, uh, they have this expression about the low-hanging fruit, in other words, the fruit that's easily grasped, uh, is in energy efficiency. Actually, it's not in energy efficiency, it's energy demand reduction, because what, what has this, this uh, uh, rebound effect, whereby if you make something more efficient, in other words, you pay less the same, same amount of material, and of course, what you do is use that money you save to do something else. And that something else might be to use more energy, or either directly or indirectly. So, although many people have said that energy efficiency is a key, I think the key thing is actually reducing energy use. Not, I mean, of course we should try to more efficiency. The more efficient we can be, then the less energy we can use for the same, particular, the same output. Then the key argument is how do we reduce use? Um, and I don't think that's a very easy one. I mean, you and I and all of us here could think of ways in which we could save energy. Around the house, the house is a major consumer. You saw my little diagram that suggests that, depending on where you are, then uh, domestic use might well be up to a third of total energy use. So the potential for reduction is really dramatic. I mean, there are simple things that could be done. And most people, us, we buy a. Uh, actually, I should say something. But uh, many people, let's say, buy a relatively inexpensive fridge that, it, that is energy, very energy inefficient. If you could reduce the amount of energy your fridge uses by two thirds by buying the wrong more expensive one. Much on, in this regard lies in the hands of government. But the government could quite easily, there are no regulations that would prevent them say it anywhere, the WTO or the European Union, uh, that we demand a certain level of energy efficiency in the fridges. And of course, there are lots of other examples of that sort. But then, of course, what people might want to do is they might buy a second fridge, because the first fridge is much cheaper. So it, it is more complex than one supposes. And I, I don't think there have been any really persuasive efforts to reduce energy use because of the demand of technology. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, an economist, but I've privileged to work with chemical engineers and geologists, and I have always marveled at the breadth of their education and the eclecticism of what they uh, present. That's a wonderful example of today. Um, and I just wanted to add, and I think it's great also from you know, a little rural community to take, try and take a global perspective, um, and also to take a national perspective. And I just wanted to add my little find that. Um, which um, is that in 2004, Britain produced more primary energy than it consumed. This year, we're producing about half as much as primary energy that we consume, and that's going to continue to go down very, very steeply for the next five or ten years. So, as well as the ecological pressures, there are going to be huge economic pressures on our country, uh, resulting from the uh, changing energy supply. I, I, all I can do is agree. You know, just contribute to contribute to the debate. It seems to me to be uh, an almost no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope it's not a the suggestion, but I would really like the idea of the solar panels for the desert. But I wonder if, um, is there any environmental impact to that? Is that what the energy back? What 
Uh, well, the, the solar, solar panel systems, they don't, I mean, they, they absorb a very large proportion of the energy. And in fact, these days you can get rather clever systems whereby rather than just having a series of flat panels facing the sun, you have a series of panels which are, if you like, arranged in an arc, so that, that, and you have an energy receptor some little distance away, like the um, focus of a, of, a, of a telescope. And um, not only do they have, the plates themselves absorb a significant portion of the energy, but any reflected energy is then picked up by the, the sensor that's some small distance away, so they can be extremely efficient. Um, will, they, will they have a large effect? Well, the trouble is that there's always a, a devil in the machine that surprises you. If one just thinks, thinks it through, then the deserts are, are areas of relatively high albedo. Let's say the reflectivity of the deserts is quite high compared to the forest. Not as high as ice, of course, or snow. Um, and if you covered them, the, them with uh, solar devices, which actually capture radiation, by its very nature, then you won't get any reflection. The albedo will be... You, you will be trying to get the albedo down to zero. And the key calculation is, would that have any effect in an area as large as... as let's say North Africa, and I think the answer is we don't know, because it's not just a question of saying, well, it's only 5% of area. The key question is, have you chosen some extremely sensitive areas? Because we know that, I mean, we've all, we've all heard about the butterfly effect, although most of us, most of the time, we don't really understand what, what, what peculiar effect that is. But if, but, but if, you, if you located uh, uh, solar receptors in sensitive locations and actually that could have a, quite a significant effect that you haven't anticipated and one of the problems is that the models the computer models of atmospheric circulation and energy balance that we use are simply are, are limited to their resolution power so typically the, 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 the Met Office's most powerful models that we currently have which show throughout cover the whole Britain they have a, a, a grid size of about 30 kilometers. In other words, you're not capturing very much. If you take onto a global scale, an African scale, the, the, the grid size is about 200 kilometers. So you can't capture these things. So there are problems in the science. Uh, and of course, there are other impacts as well. Uh, they have grazing, grazing lights, impact on communities. Are they, <coughs> is the money going to flow back to them from a central governmental enterprise? Well, evidence elsewhere in many parts of Africa that doesn't happen it's in the pockets of a small number there are all sorts of implications but then you <coughs> come across the law of unintended consequences which uh, some of which some, some people uh, articulate as saying uh, we shouldn't do anything unless we're sure of the outcome well actually we don't have that luxury and most of us in our lives deal with uncertainty every day uh, we uh, Many of the, most of the things that we do have a risk associated with them and we try to evaluate the risk in personal terms. Political discourse, that was rather different. Political, political discourse is all about certainty. Uh, when, when did you find a politician who admitted himself or herself to be uncertain who was then clawed down by the press the next morning? And somehow, we, we have a mature debate in a community like this. Once you elevate that to a political level, somehow the maturity, maturity disappears. So, uh, I think there are... I think we have to take risks, personally. Uh, and then we have to try to repair the damage that might accrue as we, uh, as we carefully monitor what damage is there. Because I say, I mean, I think we... I mean, if what I've said proves to be correct, and I can't be sure that it is, of course, but if much of that proves to be correct, then we have to take some risks. Uh, the question, of course, who takes the risks? Is it us, or is it people who live in Africa, or, or wherever? I mean, the problem, really, I think, is the, the un unevil distribution of risk, both within the society and between societies. Thank you very much, Mr. Edison. Thank you. Um, well, I think it is the realistic thing. Uh, I think it's a, 
I mean, one can understand why the aspiration is there. And you might argue that the, it's important that the aspiration is there because um, of, of a particular effect which has been demonstrated time and again. <coughs> if, you, if there is something you want to achieve in the economic domain, let's say in, in industry, industry you, want to, you want to enhance a particular industry, then the most effective way of sending a signal to a, com- to a private company that's got to make a decision about investment is to, is, to, is to suggest that over the next 20 years this is going to be a good place to invest because it's a priority. <coughs> so sending those signals is very important. Um, on the other hand, what you must be careful you don't do is take the steps that will be necessary to ensure that by 2020 the lights don't go out. And at the moment, the Scottish Government's position is dependent on an assumption, which is a geologist I'm well placed to test, and that is that carbon capture and storage can be utilised on a big scale. Because what we cannot do without, and in the foreseeable future, is major central generating capacity. We say no to nuclear, and the only alternative then is to have very significant coal generation or, 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 or gas generation, um, and to make sure that the emission, if we are to meet our emissions targets, then to pump them into underground reservoirs beneath the North Sea or elsewhere. Now, there are some very serious attempts going on by serious companies. Scottish and Southern are investing massively in looking at the possibility of carbon capture and storage in North Sea reservoirs. Um, there are, the UK government's just funded uh, a couple of uh, um, uh, major experiments to look at the possibility of utilizing these things. But it strikes me that to, to hinge a whole energy policy on the assumption that carbon capture and storage would work is a risk that I would be prepared to take. I think, I think one way of make, making sure that they wouldn't take the risk is to have uh, the next election in 20 years' time. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that makes it easier for governments to make long-term statements is the fact that they won't be around to pick up the, pick up the pieces. So, the answer is no. Uh, second yeah, thank you. <coughs> Two observations and a, a, and a, and a question. I, I think our last slide is extremely illustrative of how wasteful we are uh, in, in the energy we, we consume uh, if, if it isn't an engineering uh, observation. The second is that the bar charts you uh, produced earlier uh, are also illustrative of the extent to which we will need to have a portfolio of a whole series of, of different technologies that we cannot rely on any one but we shall ultimately need a whole series of others. But also important because, and it leads me to my question, uh, if we are to import energy, where do you see the role of imported wood biomass? And uh, if so, where or which parts of the world should that be coming from? Well, if you forgive me, I'll also comment on the first part of the question as well. If, if I were running a, a government policy, bearing in mind that directly behind it is an economist, so I'm trading on, on very thin ice. What I would do would be to say that um, we're prepared to pay a premium for anyone who can deliver carbon-free electricity to the grid. And that premium wouldn't need to be particularly high. Actually. What you do is you have to, of course, give a disincentive to those who are going to give carbon-rich um, uh, energy to the grid. And what you then do is remove any obstacle to any technology. In other words, you say to the only driver is an economic driver. You say to industry, which can be highly creative, that um, they can use whatever technology they can they can find that will make the biggest profit for them in the circumstances which, when they're penalised for using carbon. Can that sort of thing work? Well, it has in the past. For example, in the 1970s and 80s, we became medical research demonstrated the impact of lead. Uh, in the atmosphere, larger than like petrol had on the brains of growing children. The, the then uh, US federal government uh, then said that the levels of lead uh, utilized in petrol in the US um, would have, within a year, uh, within 15 months, would have to be reduced to a very small proportion of what it would to be. And the whole of the US car industry said, this is the end of civilization. We know it, impossible ridiculous federal government. Within nine months, they cracked the problem 
within a year they were selling it to other engine manufacturers worldwide. The capacity of creative private industry to respond to real incentives is enormous. And what I what worries me is when politicians say, Well, we won't do that, we'll do that, and we won't do that, we'll do that. They're not competent to do that. You know, I was with an old friend of mine who's an engineer, a very experienced engineer in the big projects. And he was sitting there, and perhaps I shouldn't say this because it reflects what I can say, we were sitting there with a bunch of politicians talking about energy. And he, at one point he got really exasperated. He got up and said, the trouble is, he said, I've seen too much PowerPoint engineering and not enough real engineering. <laughs> what he meant by this, I know how things run over, run over budget. Uh, I know the technical problems that occur. I know the way you have to regard these things. And he was getting really rather irritated at, at, at government ministers coming along without any technical telling him how engineering works. So, you know, I think there's, there's that side of that, that side of it. I apologize for taking so much time up with it. It strikes me as an important point. Um, where should we get the wood from? <coughs> well, but there are some places that we, uh, I'm not an ecologist, but uh, I'm aware of the work of many ecologists in the moment where they're trying to, I mean, people are studying the way in which trees transpire, carbon, the amount of carbon they take up from the atmosphere and they give back again. In fact, one of the classic studies was in Perthshire, you know, stand of oak woodland, where for the first time they tried to measure complete carbon budget of a tree through a whole year. It was really, really fascinating. Carbon lost into the ground, gained from the ground, going into the atmosphere, being taken in from the atmosphere. And we're beginning to understand this, or they're beginning to understand that more than ever before. And so it's quite clear that there are some places where you would you, you might feel it's best to think of as a source for what you're going to burn, simply because when regrowth takes place, it will absorb much larger proportions of, of, of carbon. There are other places where you wouldn't hurt because you'd actually be putting carbon back, in, back into the system. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure I know where. I think one of the locations, for instance, is the, is the, is the southern Baltic region. Actually, Scotland has been a classic location where most of the floorboards in the new time come from, uh, come from uh, the Baltic states uh, 200 years ago. Uh, but the big forest there now, and, that might, and, and uh, as I understand it, that's an area where you might get things from. But these things have got to be controlled somehow. Uh, and I think that business of control is very difficult. I mean, every time I book a flight on an aeroplane, I'm asked whether I would like to uh, offset my, um, my, my flight miles should be trying to take um, against some forestry standard that they bought. Well, I think that's largely nonsense. It's largely nonsense because unless the tree grows for at least 100 years, there won't be any net, there won't be any saving of carbon. And in most of these systems, the companies lease stands of forestry for a couple of decades and then probably they're going to be cut down again. So I think it's a very, very difficult thing to police. And I think the potential for thuggery is enormous. And indeed, there was a study last year by the World Bank which indicated that some of the forestry schemes that have been set up to, uh, to, to sequester carbon actually have been taken over by, by criminal gangs. It's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a scam on a given scale. So, I think it's a bit of one. Okay, probably a little more if you want to come I think that the sound is going to be in the Scots at the moment. Well, it's me. Possibly. 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 Not for that channel, that tunnel coming across with all the energy that's in it. Would we be able to look at it ourselves at all? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure we could look after ourselves. I mean, I think that uh, I'm rather fancy the idea of running around in skins. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the whole issue of sustainability is an interesting one. I mean, if I look back, uh, in far as I'm able to, uh, as historical <coughs> civilizations, then I, I, I don't recognize any society of any significant scale that has been sustainable. 
And I think what happens is we lurch from one form of unsustainability to another. Local communities, yeah, they, they can. And actually, of course, they are if they are often isolated and don't over. And as long as the death rate is high, the last thing we want is a society that looks more local society that's growing in numbers and actually neutralizes its resources. So, uh, so I think sustainability is a, is, a, is, is a difficult issue. I think that if you wanted to maximize uh, the potential for sustainability, I think what you would say is that the best thing you can do is have flexibility. In other words, the capacity of a system which extends over a large area to respond to local circumstances. And I think, I, I, mean, I, I think it would be a very difficult question to answer your question, if you answer, say, well, do you think Britain is big enough? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that question. What I would say is that I think that I mean, the energy exempt, I think, makes the point very clearly that if we were networked in relation to energy across at least Europe, and preferably beyond, then that gives us a flexibility to be able to utilize relatively inexpensive of so sources of energy in ways that will min could minimize um, uh, emissions uh, and also minimize costs. Of course, that's, that's a key issue. Um, I mean, I have said before in different settings that I think the nation state is one of the most disastrous in inventions that, that, um, uh, that the humanity has produced. Uh, but that's, that's for another day to annoy a different audience. <laughs> Well, I think before you annoy anybody anymore, Jeffrey, we better close. <laughs> I, I'm sure that you'll agree that, in fact, despite the fact that Professor Bolton was somewhat embarrassed by my long list of his honours and important positions, that, in fact, he's shown us this evening that he deserves every single one of them. Uh, he started off by saying, using the word challenge, and I think that, in fact, the whole lecture was really a challenge. I, I think it's a challenge that you are not over-optimistic about our meeting, um, I mean, if in fact the only positive message is that we're better than Qatar um, in, in our energy use, well, I mean, sorry, but that's a bit bleak. However, but in, what you have given us is a very, very clear exposition of the underlying principles and of the problem and indeed its very nature. You have covered an amazingly wide range of times, of places, of scientific disciplines, and of course, as a geologist, as you rightly say, you take the wrong view. Um, another person, another distinguished scientist who was a biologist I had speaking, say, oh yes, but in fact, a little, uh, some little creature, wormy thing, she said, will definitely survive. Well, I mean, I think it's all very well for the scientists, but you're, you're a simple theater historian. You just wish that something would happen a bit more quickly. However, that's fine. <laughs> it was fascinating, Jeffrey. It was challenging, as I said, and really very, very stimulating. And like the person who spoke earlier, I thought the picture of the fourth bridge actually summed it up quite amazingly. It certainly is a challenge for the future. So thank you very, very much indeed. And um, I'd like you to thank Jeffrey again. For his In conclusion, since I'm in a thanking mood, um, I would like to um, give the very, very sincere thanks um, to our sponsors or supporters in uh, the Dumfriesen Gallery project. It is being partly financed by the Scottish Government and the European Community Dumfriesen Gallery leader, 2007 to 2013. Our other supporters include the Buckley Charitable Foundation, the Hollywood Trust, Lloyd's TSB Foundation, and the James Weir Foundation. We also have a number of private independent supporters um, who don't wish their names mentioned. And absolutely in conclusion, once again, thank you to you for coming, and indeed for Buckley Academy in being such splendid hosts. So thank you very much. Stay home, and I believe the glitters are out. <laughs> God knows how much energy there is. Thank you very much.